Um, now I'm, I'm switching into English because we're very happy that um, one of the uh, leading European gallerists um, made it uh, possible uh, to stay one day longer uh, at Art Cologne. I know he was going to leave uh, on Thursday, so I'm very happy that he uh, stayed one night longer here uh, with us uh, to come on stage uh, and uh, chat about his work, about bringing different generations in the art world together, and also a little bit of, about his own biography. Welcome from Paris, Camille Menour. Hi, Camille. Welcome. Um, Camille, how was the fair? It was amazing. It was nice to be uh, in Germany, in Cologne, and uh, to discover and to smell art in Germany. Very important for me, as you might know. Uh, in which way does art in Germany smell different? When I started uh, my career, I was a student and was visiting Art Cologne, which was the fair, the fair with a big F. I was amazed with uh, the density and quality of the, 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 the exhibitors. And um, I was always uh, obsessed by Germany. My wife is German, I have five kids, I'm living as a German in my family, even if my German is not here. I'm very sad for that, sorry for that. But you met your wife, uh, when exactly, in, in Greece, no? Yes, it was intimate, our conversation, yes. <laughs> But that's right, I, I met my wife when I was 23 years old, after the university, she was 16. That's why I'm, not, I'm a little bit hiding that. And uh, I knew that it was my wife. I was so in love with her in the first days, and I wanted to become a gallerist to show her that I could do something that she could be proud, because I was not from that um, background. But I was very, in the, my last uh, year of university, reading a lot of books of um, only art history. I was obsessed. I wanted to become the most important dealer in my country. And I was working very hard. When, when did you actually came, come up with this idea of you know, just being so straightforward and telling yourself, I want to be the most, become the most important art dealer in France? It, it, when I met my wife. She came from a very um, aristocratic family with a cultural background. So she knew everything behind and much, be, much, be, uh, she was, she had everything in terms of knowledge. Mm -hmm. She was speaking me about MoMA, about Tate, about Saint Pompidou, and then even didn't know, mostly, you know, I was uh, doing uh, some slippery in the Musée du Louvre when I was young. So for me, art is, was uh, a territory of unknown uh, uh, words, uh, names. It was very strange, but I became obsessed and I was very ashamed in the beginning even to get to galleries. It was very something that most of the people who don't visit Art Cologne or Art Basel, they, are very, they have a kind of apprehension mm -hmm. to get to galleries because culture is a very small world. It's a, in France, in French, we say entre soi. It's, you know, you and I, we are Close having uh, you know, a, a, drink, a, a glass of wine and we are speaking about this artist or this artist. And we know. And we know. And we know. As they say. Know, as they say. And for me, it was very important to become one of the leaders, to give, to, to share to the audience. For me, I never forgot that when I was uh, 25, I was a little bit ashamed to get to the gallery, who became friends of mine, Yvon Lambert, Durand Dessert, because it was elitist, it was entre soi, you know, we know, and I, I didn't know. I mean, you, you were studying, studying uh, uh, economics in yeah. Paris, and you became an art dealer sort of step by step. I mean, you, you started selling lithographies, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, basically from door to door, is yeah. that correct? Yeah. I, 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 was, I would have paid a lot to be the intern of one of the mentors, to understand, to learn, you know, to serve the coffee to them and to understand the landscape. But it was not my case, so I started in a very, you know, as everyone, you know, you start with something, you know. It's like piano, you know, you learn a little bit solfege and after you have a teacher. Me, I didn't have a teacher, so I had to, to learn with books, with artists. 
with after with museum directors, curators, and you know, we started slowly and slowly, step by step. My first artist was Caderatia, who was uh, the the curator of the Berlin Biennale. He was my first artist. How did you convince him to work with you? He was like me. It was him. I know. We, he, uh, when I'm saying he was like me, we were in the bar. He, he, he was like you. Yes. Okay, yeah, we yeah. were in the disco. We were sharing ideas, and we wanted to to reach and to touch the clouds. We were extremely ambitious. He's extremely uh, clever, and he has uh, the idea of doing something with uh, where he's from. You know, the kind of mixity, porosity between generation, between origins. Mm. He's French, but with an Algerian uh, background like me. Like you, yeah. So it was very interesting to kind of uh, have conversation about that, about what is art, what is Sardin Appel of Delacroix, what is, you know, uh, La Ronde de Nuit of Rembrandt. We were obsessed, conversation for hours. The only thing, he was drinking a lot, I'm not drinking. You're not drinking, not to this day, you're vegetarian. Yes. You live a very healthy lifestyle. Yeah, I'm not oh. smoking. The same wife since 32 years old. I'm a little bit nothing. No sins. No sins. Ah. Yeah. Um, when, I, when I was doing some research in, ahead of this conversation, I found this quote from you about your mother, yeah. uh, who apparently was a very big influence on you because she would talk to you into a way of making it in your country. I mean, you were born in Algeria, but you, you grew up in Paris. I yes. mean, you, you came as a baby, as a two-year-old, two right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did she actually say to you when you were a young kid? Uh, in terms of when I was kids, she wanted me to, because she divorced my father, and uh, she was, um, she was, she, she can speak French, but not perfectly. She doesn't write, and she, want me, she wanted me to, to become a doctor or a lawyer or maybe a journalist. But she didn't want a me journalist, to... journalist, really? Maybe, you know. Doctor, a yes. Doctor, yes. Lawyer, yes. A journalist, you know. She wanted me to become Christophe. Uh. But I couldn't um, imagine something else instead of being a gallerist. I wanted to be a gallerist. And for her, it was a failure. She said to me, are you really serious to, be, to sell frames? For her, it was frames. It was something that she did so much in terms of investment, you know, cleaning houses and doing everything, bringing me the best education, but I would become a gallerist. For her, it was abstract. It was, no. How did you explain what art means to you and what the art business also could mean for you as a career to your mother? She believed in me. Uh, she knew that I was the older uh, child of the family and was always someone very positive. And the first time, she, she was against the idea. But she believed, but she was very sad. But she believed. Mm -hmm. There was two things. I wanted to do art, and I found a German wife. She was very... Um, surprised? Strange. It was a surprise, and, you know, but I, I said to her that uh, she was married by force with my father, and I said to her, I love this girl, and I, she would become my wife. So at the end, she said, okay, mm -hmm. he knows where he wants to go, so why not? But it was a long uh, perspective, you know, become, becoming a gallerist when you are telling this to wa your wife who is 25 years, no money, no galleries, it's uh, something. How did you actually start your first gallery? I was 32 or 3, 32, and I found this very small, tiny gallery in Rue Romazarine in Saint-Germain-des-Prés. It was... Uh, I had the opportunity to open a very small space, mm -hmm. and we started the photography because it was the medium that I could even have in mind because photography was developed in the moment in France, and there was the Salon Pai photo, and I started bringing to the audience some of the bigger uh, uh, photographers like Clark, uh, Japanese Araki, Peter Beard, Annie Leibovitz, Stephen Shaw, Danny Lyon, the big American, yeah, the big also American. magazine yeah. photographers exactly. of the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it came, and after I, I, I found some of the artists who became now stars like uh, Camille Enro, uh, Kaida, you, I was mentioning, Zineb Sedira, who is the French pavilion this year in Venice. Yeah. 
Latifi Shark, who is the Swiss pavilion. So after 10, 15 years, it's clarified in, in the landscape, and those artists who were very like me became some, one of the most interesting artists of their generation. Was there a moment during the, you know, building up the, the gallery and you know, working with more and more artists when you sort of realized, I think I'm making it in the business? Oh, it's, you never sing that. You always have, I, I'm always, how do you say, I'm the kind of man who is never satisfied. I'm very happy what I'm doing, but I always watch the, the kind of uh, limits or the kind of trying to, you know, for example, we just hire, and I'm extremely happy for that. It's a third chapter of the gallery. We are hiring two uh, um, um, people from the, instu the French institutions, you know. Uh, Christian Landet is just joined two years before from the Giacometti Foundation with us. And in three weeks, uh, Sylvie Patry, who is the, uh, the director of the Musée d'Orsay, is joining us. So it's another challenge because you will uh, create kind of dialogues between um, 19th century 20th century and 21st century. So trying to bring uh, some content in terms of editorial program and to make it against what are the very big galleries, you know, like Gagosian, Hauser and Wiers and Zwirner. My idea is to focus on a very programmatic situation in terms of what is uh, Monet to Camille en uh, what, well, what, what is Monet to Camille en it's very interesting. It's yeah. a question, you know, what is Lily's the installation with the idea of the Ikebanas that she had in the Venice Biennale? So it's very interesting. And Sylvie, who is very interested with contemporary art, would do that. Mm. It's very interesting for me to have uh, the eye, the vision of someone who is an, a worldwide expert of impressionism to Camiro. But it can be to Mohamed Bourouissa also who is one of the very leading young French artists uh, of his generation, who won last year the, Bors, the Dutch Boss, uh, who is very interesting, who is having a project in MoMA next year. CV would drive with him what to do, and what, of course he will make it, but with an eye, a different eye. How come you, you start hiring people from institutions? What's the idea behind it? Many ideas but also to create a, a situation, a territory in which artists can deliver something with not uh, only the, the perspective of a traditional curator, trying to bring something else, to shift the point to another situation. We know that we are in a revolution situation in terms of too many fairs too many auctions, too many. So my idea is to stop a little bit the point and to speak with the artists and to try to deliver something very singular. When, when you say you live in revolutionary times in the art world, what do you think is going to change? First of all, I would say too many fairs. It's extremely complex to always call an artist to invite him for lunch and saying, please do me another work for Art Cologne, or please do me another work for Art Miami, or please do me another work for Art Basel. It's very complex, you know. First of all, um, also auctions. You were mentioning the Paul Allen auction, one billion five. It's, can you imagine all those amounts of, you know, I just saw today one of the auction guy also. So there's a mixity between auction, fair, and all those things, it's very difficult to, um, to understand now, even for galleries, for artists, they hate fairs. But we need fairs, because it's the meeting point in which you find, you meet uh, museums, foundation, collectors, artists, and to show the vision, the DNA of the gallery. But there's so much, so it's difficult. My point of view is to stop a little bit, to think with artists, to bring some guys, those guys who are from the public institution, and to try to do something very special. So if you would have the sort of the capacity and the freedom of um, explaining your vision for the art world, 
how should the art world really look like after the revolution? Very, very good question. It's a debate. You know, um, 21th century would bring so many uh, uh, um, people behind art. When I started, it was entre soi. Very few people in vernissage now. When I were opening a, gallery, uh, an, 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 a vernissage, there's hundreds of people, so many people. So we need to, I would say, in my point of view, every gallery should have a line, a vision, a DNA to try to make it. You know, not those kind of or corporate galleries. It's my point of view. I have an idea. This is my third chapter. So, and what's going to happen in that? I'm 56. Chapter? I have ideas. COVID brought me many ideas. I wrote a lot, and I know where I want to go, and I know where I don't want to go. Where don't you want to go? In, you know, I would be much more selected, and I would be much more close to artists and have less exhibition, more uh, editorial and position. For the moment, we have an incredible show in three points of the galleries. We have four galleries in Paris. Eugène Carrière, an artist who is totally forgotten, who is, who is in all uh, the American uh, museum, in Musée d'Orsay, in Petit Palais. I'm sure there's many here in Germany. He was a very important artist who inspired uh, Picasso, Giacometti, many artists, and he was totally forgotten. He's in storage of museums or somewhere. And my idea is to create a, 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 an overview on this very important artist who, is, mm. uh, who was at the avant-garde in the 19th century, uh, to bring to the viewers something very special. Mm. It's my taste. I am collecting this since 20 years. I mean, you, you, you mentioned when we started our conversation two minutes ago, uh, you mentioned that books were so vital and so important for you when you got into the art world. And as far as I know, you, you're very much concerned about publishing books, yeah. accompanying uh, the, the shows and exhibitions. Yeah. Um, is that for the same reason? Exactly. To share, to transmit. Because I want to give the opportunity to some other camel who were a little bit uh, blind in terms of knowledge and to have a book and to read, and I started with a book. I bought in a flea market a book of Jan Saudek, a photography. Oh, really? Was that was the first book you bought? It was 50 francs in the public uh, shops, and I bought it for five francs. You know, it was totally smashed with nothing. I had to open the, the, the pages like that. But that's, and, that's an, the perfect art dealer, definition of a great art dealer. Yeah. It's, it costs 50 euros, but you bought it for five. For five, in a flea market. Yeah. Yes. Right? Yes, you I have remember. To, you have to I find remember it. the free market. And now I'm very sad because I lost this book. No it way. was the first stone. Yeah. And I remember I was in my house with Annika, that I told you, my dear wife that I love, who is my inspiration. And I said I would become a gallerist. I didn't know where, how, why. And I knew that I was, it became an obsession. It became an obsession. And it was not become an art, an art dealer. I wanted to become the best gallerist in Paris, the best one, because I was complex. I was very, um, had something in my uh, uh, stomach. stomach, and I, I, was, I had this uh, feeling of being outside of the game. And I wanted to be one of the, uh, the actors, and not one of the actors, I wanted to be the one. You've always sort of I have sort of shied away from the term in France there for a while. They called you the Sinedine Sidan uh, of the art world. And you were always like, no, you know, why Sinedine Sidan, right? Yes, because it's a little bit redu re re reductor to because I'm from Algiers. My origin is also from Algiers. And um, so I wanted to be criticized or observed or analyzed by what I was doing, not right. because of my origin. I wanted to that people would say, oh, what he's doing is, I hate it, or I don't like it, I don't go to this gallery, but because I am a gallerist, not because of my origin. I wanted to be a, a known, and because I'm Kamel, but I could have been Christophe. Yeah, and you, the other way around. You know, you yeah. understand? Because yeah. I was totally, totally French. French. The only, the only thing, thing that, that I'm, I'm not happy, happy with my, my life is I'm um, not speaking German. It was a big mistake for me. So. Does your wife actually speak German with your five kids? Yeah. So, so you're, have, it's a, you're a bit excluded in that 
100%, yeah. So it's really a sad situation. <laughs> so I'm with my wife and they're speaking German. I, I feel totally strange of that. I did a big Wait, mistake. What, what are, in, in which kind of moments does your wife suddenly switch over to German when she talks to the kids? Dinners. Giving her, giving them the good manners. Right. It's always in German. And I know that it's how to, you know, to sit and how, you know, she's very like that. And I'm very happy for that, but I don't understand. Now I, I understand German, but not enough. Do you, have a, do you have a favorite German word? Yes. Ich bin eine Deutsche. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Now, I, I asked Daniel um, uh, just a, f a few minutes ago about um, his, probably his favorite piece of art. And if I've done my research right, um, very important artwork in your life was a piece by Basquiat. Yes. Yes. It was a, a, an art piece uh, by Basquiat, bought by a friend of mine who became a friend, one of the most important collectors in the world, who came in my small, tiny gallery when I was beginning. Uh, and he bought this work for an incredible price at the moment in pieces or, or Sotheby's. And he was always inviting me for, to have lunch or dinner, I'm sorry, and with wines, incredible wines. And he showed me this incredible uh, work, Riding with the Death by Basquiat. At the time, he bought it for two or three million something. For me, it was insane. But I was always thinking that if I would steal an art piece, it would be this work. So when he was going to wash his hand, or, you know, I wanted to take the work. But it was a huge work. <laughs> You know, it's an amazing work. You know this I, work, you know? This yeah, yeah, work yeah. in which it you is, have a, a yeah. you know, with the, the horse mm -hmm. and the skeleton, it was a prophecy of the death of Bastia. He painted this work six months before. He probably knew, had he a was feeling smelling that, he, that yeah. he would go in, mm. a, in the sky. So mm. it's a beautiful painting. And the guy, the collector, was always saying to me, it's not, it's not expensive. I was really thinking <laughs> that he said to me, no, because you will see. And he was right. We saw the, the incredible result of, after the painting of 100 millions. And this painting would cost even more. And he's not going to sell. And I remember it was my first uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sensation with what is a masterpiece? Mm -hmm. What is art history? Mm -hmm. What is this kind of iconic image which would fit the, the end of the 20th century? Um, now, we've, we've been, been experiencing, experiencing you now for the last couple of minutes here on stage, and I, I get the feeling how you convince artists to work with you, just by listening to you and, and chatting with you. Um, is it true that you even convinced a very famous artist when you accidentally ran into him on a flight? Yes. And the artist was traveling first or business class, you were traveling... Business. Business yes. and you were traveling. Economy. Economy. Beginning. And you convinced him yes. to stay with you. Yes, so you work very hard in uh, you know, all the small. Uh, uh, I'm German. Yeah, yeah German. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Just I'm living always the saying cliche, my, my kids. The cliche. Yes, the, the cliche, yeah. So, yes, uh, that's why it was Daniel Buren. It was in 2006. I was changing my small gallery to the, the gallery that we are now in Hotel particulier, um, and I wanted to have a very important, because we were with those young artists, you know, Camille Enro, Latif Aishak, Kader Atia, and I wanted someone who was uh, a little bit leading, iconic artist, and it was Buren, he was uh, doing a show in Seoul, and had uh, Zineb Sedira, who was in the Biennale, and uh, we fly together, I went to him, and he was extremely nice. Uh, in the lounge, just in front of the lounge, I was not... But I said to him, maybe we could have a coffee, and he said yes, and he went from the first floor to the second, to the economy, in the door. and we stayed, uh, we spent seven hours together. And he I couldn't was... escape you, also. No, because I was with right? him, you know, I loved him. But, no, but no. for seven hours, I mean... Because like... we were speaking about everything, we were speaking about Buren, we didn't speak at all about me. We spoke about his obsession, what he was, uh, about Serra. We spoke about his exhibition in which he was fired from the Guggenheim. And I knew everything, and I was reading uh, Buren. Buren in France is a very important artist, even if he's a worldwide artist. In France, he's, the, mm. he's God. So for me, it was impossible, but I said, I try. And I was very convinced myself, so I gave him my... my I, was, I, I, I wanted to him, I said to him, because he, he was out of, he, he decided to, 
to go away from a very important gallery, Marianne Goodman. This happened to all galleries, and he had the opportunity to go to many galleries. And I said to him one word, if I was Daniel Buren, I would not go to, Dan to Yvon Lambert, I would go to Kamel Menour, because, <laughs> because I would go, I would be the Sherpa to bring him to the, to the Everest, because I'm very dedicated. I would work for him. So it was something that stayed in his mind, and two weeks after, he called me back, he said to me, Mr. Manour, your uh, request was serious? I said, I was like that, and we had the dinner, and we signed together. Wow. Uh, Camille, just, uh, we're about to uh, finish because our time's been running up, but um, I've been reading that you, just one last question I have to ask about the political situation in general. Um, how, how is your friendship with Emmanuel Macron? I love him. I think we deserve this kind of... Um, it's my point of view. I think we are in a situation extremely difficult in France, in which you have... I think you have the same in Germany, uh, all the extreme mm -hmm. who are raising. So it's very... We need to have someone who can speak to everyone and who try to bring a perspective to the country, not only to the country, to Europe, mm -hmm. to, dance, to dance tango with Germany. It's very important. And it's very difficult to dance to tango dance. with Germany, right? Yes. But it takes two. Yes, but it's very important to try to yeah. dance tango. I just have this picture in mind of Olaf Scholz and Emmanuel Macron dancing Something. tango together. Yeah. yeah. But um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking your time uh, and staying here one day longer in Cologne with us. It was a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Kemal Menur. Thank you. Kemal. Thank you. Thank you.